So our reading this morning is taken from Revelation 11, and we read from verses 1 to 14. Uh, some of it is a bit of a repetition from last the last week or two, but we are going to focus especially on verses 7 to 14 this morning. So let's read Revelation 1, 11 verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. And this is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets that had tormented those who live on earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And then they went up to heaven in a cloud while the enemies looked on. At that very hour there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe has passed, and the third woe is coming soon. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I've entitled my message uh, this morning, The Beast from the Abyss and the Two Witnesses. The Beast from the Abyss and the Two Witnesses. When we look at human history, we find that there's been a long war against God and again against God's rule. It really started in the Garden of Eden, where our first parents were told, you can be like God. He's withholding something from you. As we go through the, through the Bible, we find many instances where people have set themselves up as God. We read in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 3, that King Nebuchadnezzar built this statue of himself and he required of all the citizens of the Babylonian Empire to worship this statue. And we know that the friends of Daniel did not do so. And then when we go forward in during the time of the Roman Empire, we find the, the Caesar cult, the imperial cult, where the Caesar or the king was seen as a god and had to be worshipped. And we know that many Christians lost their lives because they would not worship. They would not worship the Caesar. They would not say Caesar is Lord. They would say Jesus is Lord. And in our modern times, I think there is no other ideology that has, that has been responsible for the persecution and death uh, of many, many Christians. The, 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 the ideology that has been responsible for the death of most Christians and believers in the world that the world has ever seen must be communism. It stands head and shoulders above anything else. And, and unfortunately, our youth, our young people of today, they have forgotten. They don't know the stories of communism. They don't know what had happened in the, in the 
20th century and the time of the of the USSR and and Red China and how Christians have been martyred and even in places such as uh, uh, Cuba and North Korea and Cambodia. Uh, Karl Marx, the the father of communism, or really who who, who pinned the ideas of communism or or Marxism, which which led to communism, wrote the following. He said, "Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people." The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for the real happiness. If we can free people from the from this this thing called religion, then people will re have real happiness. For it's all an illusion. To call on them to give up the illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. People who are religious are living on illusions. And religion is just the sigh of an oppressed creature. Vladimir Lenin wrote in his book, Religion, uh, called Religion, Atheism is a natural and inseparable part of Marxism. And he says, all modern religions and churches, all and of every kind of religion or religious organization are always considered by Marxism as the organs of a bourgeois reaction used for the protection of the exploitation and the stupefaction of the working class. So in other words, religion is just used to, to keep the working class in their place and to stupefy them, to make them stupid. And it has to be removed. And nothing has changed. In communist China, Christians are being told at this very hour to replace crosses and religious symbols with images of their president, Xi Jinping. Signs outside churches forbids anyone under the age of 18 to enter. <clears throat> the Ten Commandments are, are printed over by quotes of Confucius and Xi Jinping. Uh, in 2018, January 2018, the Golden Lampstand Church was demolished, was blown up and removed within a few hours. The picture that I used for to, to advertise today's message. One of the largest, largest Protestant Christian churches in Communist China, 20,000 members. And then early in, or in December, the early rain church pastor Wang Yi and his wife were in prison for nine years. And earlier this year, there were published 41 new rules, control measures for religious groups. And these include everything. Um, how you hold rites and rituals, how you select leaders, how you have annual meetings, how you hire staff, how you handle funds. And these have to be reported to the religious affairs office and without the permission of the of the authorities you can't organize a bible study you cannot uh, if you get permission you must hold it in a party approved venue a party approved time a party approved leader and party approved material and that's just in the east in the west the same thing is happening people are being taken to court for refusing to bake a cake for same-sex weddings. Uh, people are being taken to court for refusing to use certain pronouns for all the hundreds of genders that have come up upon the scene in the last few, few weeks and months and years. And per persecution is increasing all the time. A lot of what is in the Bible is now considered hate speech. To say such a thing that Jesus is the only way to God is considered to be bigotry. And we see this being warned. We see the warning of this. We see uh, we are being warned of this also in the book of Revelation. When we look at the text that we have before us this morning. And we are told that the persecution against God's people, against God's church, 
will increase until the end of time. And that's what this text is about this morning. Very sobering text. And the first thing I want to mention here is the beast from the abyss. In verse 7 we read, Now when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. That is the two witnesses. We said the two witnesses are the church of Jesus Christ and the word of God. And they will be attacked. When will this happen? When it says when they had finished their testimony, we know that they will testify for 1,260 days or 42 months or three and a half years, which is the gospel age. So at the end of time, towards the end of the gospel age, just before Jesus' return, the two witnesses will be overpowered and killed. It actually is happening all the time. And persecution and oppression is increasing all the time. The question is, who is this beast from the abyss? Now, the Bible uses the picture of a grotesque beast in the book of Revelation as well as in the prophecy of Daniel to describe a godless political system. And throughout Revelation, there are these two beasts and the one beast represents the political powers of this world or the political system, the godless political system. And the other beast, the false religion, false Christianity, counterfeit Christianity and all the other false religions of this world. And this is the first mention of the beast from the abyss. Remember, the abyss is the abode of demons and the Lord of the abyss is Satan himself. It's like hell before the final judgment. And this beast comes from the abyss. He has, he has his commission from the abyss, from the Lord of the abyss. And he receives his power from the Lord of the abyss, Satan himself. And he is coming on the world scene. And as we read through, through from here on to the end of Revelation, we hear again and again of this beast in increasing measure. And increasing detail in Revelation 13 and 16 and 19 and 17 and 20. And so here we meet him for the first time. And these two beasts are described. Who they are and what they represent. In Revelation 13, the first part of that chapter, we hear from the beast from the sea, which is a political system, a godless political system. It's the beast that comes from the sea. It's called the beast because there's nothing human-like in this creature. This creature is something that cannot be described as a man. He is not in the image and the likeness of God anymore. The second beast, the beast from the earth, is also called the false, false prophet or the great prostitute. And there are these two figures and all you have to remember that at this stage is that there's the, the political system and the religious system, the false, the godless political system and the false religious powers of this world. But today we are just looking at the false political power or the godless political power that rises all the time. That seeks and strives to overthrow God's rule and God's good government. And we are told in the Bible that towards the end of time, the power of this godless political system and there are many of them will increase all the time until it is situated and all concentrated in one powerful individual called the man of lawlessness or the antichrist it's important that the same john who wrote this book of revelation also wrote in his letters that many antichrists have already come and many others will still come and what will happen is that they will increase in power and influence and control towards the end of time. We don't know who the last Antichrist will be. But we can recognize them because the Bible gives a definition of what an Antichrist is and what the beast from the abyss is. In two passages I briefly just want to mention. The one is in 2, two Thessalonians 2 verse 3 and 4. He says, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come until 
the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed. Who is he? How will we recognize him? He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshipped. That's the definition. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God and is worshipped. And he sets him, the second thing, he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So whenever somebody comes as a political leader and sets himself up over the things of God and proclaims himself to be God, that person is an antichrist. And this will increase. And uh, the intensification of this process will happen towards the end of time. And Daniel is described as follows in Daniel 7 verse 25. He will speak against the Most High, blasphemy. He will oppress the saints, he will persecute the saints, and he will try to change the set times and laws. He will deify himself. And that is who the Antichrist is. And initially the false prophet, the false church, and the false leaders of the church in the world, and the beast from the abyss, they will be in cahoots. They will be friends. They will work together. False religion is always ridden on the back of polit evil political systems. That's the only way they flourish and survive. The real church is persecuted. The real Christians die. But the false church rides on the beast up to a point. And we are told in Revelation 17 until the beast turns on the false church itself. Turns on the false prophet or the prostitute that rides the beast. Now this sounds all very depressing and very ominous, but let's go on to the second thing I want to mention this morning. The death of the two witnesses. And I want to say the apparent death of the two witnesses. How will the beast of the abyss react to the testimony of the two witnesses? Well, the beast doesn't like it. The beast has his origin of his power and his own origin from the abyss where Satan rules. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like the church and he doesn't like the word of God. And in Revelation 11 verse 7 we read, The beast that comes from the abyss will attack them, the two witnesses, and kill them. So will this satanic world power, the satanic political system in the end manage to kill off the church and destroy the word of God? What is going to happen? What does this mean? Well, the book of Revelation once again describes this in greater detail as we go towards the end. The pressure and the persecution upon the people of God and the church of Jesus Christ will increase ever more as we approach the day of the return of the Lord. And there will come a time when it will look as if all has been lost. There will come a time in the, in the later chapters of Revelation is described as a final attack on the city of God, the city of God called Zion, where the armies of the world are arrayed against the city. And it will look as if all is lost. As, the, as if the church is dead and as if the word of God is destroyed. And in verse 8 we read that the bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is called figuratively Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Where is this city? Where will we find this city? Sodom is a, is a, is a symbol of uncleanness and perversion, Egypt of oppression. And Jerusalem of persecution and martyrdom, where our Lord Jesus was crucified. So where is this city? Well, it's everywhere. It's everywhere where the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and persecution and oppression is the result. And the killing of anyone who witnesses for Christ. This city is everywhere. It's every town. It's every city of the world where we as Christians face persecution. Jerusalem is wherever the gospel is preached and wherever there is death and persecution. And again and again in Revelation, we read about 
the people who have been persecuted, like John is on the Isle of Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In chapter 6, we read about the souls under the altar that cry out to the Lord, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our death? And they are there, they have been martyred because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so it goes on. How will the godless and unrepentant world react to their death? Verse 10 tells us the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them. Their dead, their dead bodies are lying in the city called Jerusalem or Sodom or Egypt. And the inhabitants of the earth will look at them and will gloat over them and celebrate by sending each other gifts. They are so happy. These pesky witnesses are dead. The two prophets that tormented them so, those who lived on earth. Finally, they are out of the way. Finally, we as godless people of the world, we may live as we please. We may use the pronouns we want. We may marry or live together with whom we want. We may worship what we want. And nobody will tell us. The church in the world and the word of God is silent. Nobody will tell us nasty things about a God that gets angry about sin. A God that will punish people for their rebellion. People do not want to hear that. And this has happened throughout history. Just one example in the old Soviet Union in the years 1925 to 1947, there was a, a group called the League of Militant Atheists or the Society of the Godless. That was their name formed by a man called Yaroslavsky. He, he formed this League of Militant Atheists. He was the influence behind it, the Society of the Godless. You know what was their motto? The storming of heaven. The storming of heaven. And their purpose, the promotion of atheism and the extermination of religion in all its manifestations. And they thought they were going to accomplish it. And the church in the USSR, in the Russia today, is still alive and well. But that's not the end, my friends. The good news is that's not the end. And my third thing I want to mention this morning is that the resurrection of the two witnesses. The resurrection. In verse 9 we read, For three and a half days men from every People, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse their burial. And in verse 11, But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Three and a half days, a very brief period of time. It, it makes us think of the time that the Lord Jesus Christ was in the grave. And we know that you cannot kill the church. I've mentioned before, the church is not a building. The church is a group of people, living stones, in which God lives by His Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in the church. And even if you kill the person physically, that person goes to be with the Lord. You can only kill the body, but you cannot kill the soul. And you cannot kill the Word of God either, because the Word of God is forever. We read in, uh, in Isaiah, we read the following. It says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Whoever touches the church, whoever touches Zion, is touching the apple of God's eye. You are poking your finger in the eye of God. You cannot kill the church. All you can do is you can provoke God to anger. And the word of God will stand forever. The word of God is eternal. You cannot destroy it. And God will say in verse 12, it says, Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to these two dead bodies of the witnesses, Come up here. 
And they went up to heaven in a cloud and the enemies looked on. So even if you can manage to kill some Christians, even if you can manage to kill all the Christians, they will be taken to heaven. And you cannot kill their souls. And it's only a brief period of time. It's only three and a half days, not three and a half literal days. It just describes a very brief period of time just before the end, just before the Lord returns. And the first signs of the Lord's return is that he will, he will come and he will repay them for their wickedness. He will repay them for their wickedness. In verse 13, we read at that very hour, that very hour when they are resurrected, there was a severe earthquake and the tent of the city collapsed and 7,000 were, people were killed in the earthquake. Not to be understood literally, it's just that God will react. God will punish those who determined to kill the church, to destroy the word of God. They will not get away with it. And then we read in verse 13 also, the survivors, those who survived, were terrified and they gave glory to the God of heaven. Not the glory of true worshippers, the grudging glory of people who know that they are outmaneuvered, that they are overpowered, that they can do nothing. They will give worship. That's where it says in to Philipp Philippians chapter 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not because they believe it from their hearts and because they like to believe it. They just know that that's the reality. And they cannot do anything about this. So the world, the rebellious world will give grudging worship to its maker. But however, unfortunately, it will be too late for them. It will be too late and it will not save them. I want to be conclude by saying this is the final rejection of all hope. The verse 14 says the second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. These events are described as the second world because for three and a half years, for, for the whole gospel age, from Jesus' ascension to Jesus' return, these two witnesses, the church of Jesus Christ and the word of God has been witnesses in the world. And the Gentiles have been allowed access, the unbelievers have been allowed access to, into the city of God. They've even been allowed into the outer courts of the temple. And they've heard these two witnesses. And all the while they've tried to silence these witnesses. They've tried to put them down, to persecute them and to kill them. To eradicate their testimony from the world, from the history of the world. And when they seem to achieve that, they congratulate themselves. And they, they have a huge feast and a celebration. And they send each other gifts. What they do not realize is that they are trying to kill that very thing, the only thing that can save them. That's all they can do. And when the second woe is past, and the third woe is coming, there is no more hope left. Because the third woe is the final judgment. So all hope is past. And that's what is so sad about this. I want to ask you today, if you are a Christian, are you witnessing? Do the people of the world hear the word of God and the testimony of Jesus from your mouth and from your life? Because you're the only one that are maybe able to reach a certain number of people, a certain group of people. Maybe they don't hear it from anyone else. Maybe you're the only Christian they know. And we are living in the time of the second world. I don't know whether we are towards the end or in the middle. We don't know. But we have to witness. And maybe you fear, you say, well, the world will like it. I may end up in jail. Or in, if you live in certain places in the world, you may just disappear. Or they will torture you or they will kill you. 
What they do in, in certain countries, they take you to prison and they harvest your organs while you are alive. Until you die. But the good news is they cannot ultimately kill you. Because you belong to Christ. Your soul belongs to Christ. And if you die, he will call you up and say, come up here. Come up here, my good and faithful servant. If you're an unbeliever today, you're not sure what you believe. Maybe you like Christianity. Maybe you, you hate Christianity. You want to silence this. You want to silence the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Just realize this. You may silence it. You may silence the witness of the Christians in your life. But this is your final hope. You are living in the time of the second woe. When this woe passes, when this woe is past, then it will be too late. Then the third woe will come. And that is the day of judgment. This scene in the book of Revelation, scene number three, shows how the world will be warned again and again and again. But the world will remain unrepentant. Despite the suffering inflicted by the fifth trumpet, the demons who, who torment the world, despite the killing unleashed by the sixth trumpet, one third of mankind being killed because of their godlessness, despite the fact of the witnesses, the world will remain unrepentant. And when the second woe is passed and the third woe comes, it will be too late. Amen. Dear Lord, we pray that we will take these warnings and these words to heart, both as Christians as well as unbelievers. That as Christians we will not give up witnessing being witnesses to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it may end up for us badly, even if we may end up in prison, even if we may be persecuted, even if we may end up in a court of law or even die. But Lord, you know that they cannot kill the church. They cannot kill the word of God. And our eternity is safe with you. It's safeguarded in heaven by the power of God himself. And Lord, I pray this morning for those who are unbelievers, those who are not yet sure of their salvation, that they will understand that they are living in a time of grace. They are living in the gospel age. And they hear the, the testimony of the witnesses. They hear the testimony of the word of God. But a time will come when it will be too late. And I pray that many will hear and listen and repent and turn from their wicked ways and live. I pray for your blessing upon your people, on the people of Brackenfeld Church and anyone else who may listen to this message. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends,